get started. My wife, Victoria, my wife is from Austin, so maybe we'll go back. <laughs> All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us again for our second webinar series in the Maryland Masterclass, Juggling the Job Hunt with Danny Rubin. And welcome back to those who are here for part one and welcome to those who are tuning in for the first time. I'm Ellie Garrity, the Manager of Alumni Career Programs, and we're really happy that you could join us today. Our presenter, Danny, has another interactive webinar for you today, so we hope you feel comfortable asking questions and sharing your experience with your fellow Terps in the chat box. As some of you may know, our presenter, Danny Rubin, is an author and the founder of Rubin, a leading provider of online curriculum for business communication skills. He's a former TV reporter and a national news consultant, and Danny works with educators and trainers around the country to help students and professionals communicate better. I'll pass it off to Danny to share a little bit more about his experience and get things started. Go ahead, Danny. Thank you, Ellie, and thanks everybody for coming today. And is anybody here who was here the first time? You couldn't, you didn't get enough of me. I, I lured you back. If, if there's any repeat customers, let us know. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thanks for coming back. We're covering a whole different set of topics today. First time was LinkedIn. Thank you, everybody who was here from before and who was here for the first time. We covered LinkedIn the last time, and today we're going to do resumes, cover letters, and email outreach. And I know so many of us have had our careers thrown up in the air. We may still have our jobs. We may have lost our jobs. We may be thinking about a new opportunity either way because everything is different now and the world has changed. But how we communicate about ourselves to open doors has not changed. And what I'm going to share with you today are some strategies to become a better writers and communicators about our value when people are assessing us through job applications and through outreach emails. I'm going to teach you how to use your words in ways that the competition often does not and it will hopefully help you open that big door that's going to lead to a critical opportunity. I mean, no more critical than right now. We all know what's going on in the world. We all see the news. We all are feeling it ourselves. Now is the time to put out the best job application you have ever written. And I'm glad you're here today because that's what we are going to talk about. So as Ellie said, I'm a former TV reporter and I am a former consultant to news stations. I also I work today as well in public relations. I'm based in Virginia Beach and I have a master's degree from University of Maryland. Let me minimize my chat a little bit. In broadcast journalism back in 2007, undergraduate from the University of Virginia. And I've worked in the communication space since Maryland, in front of the camera, behind the camera, consulting, with news stations, ghostwriting for executives, hosting media events, crisis communications, website copy, all kinds of communication skills for the business world. And what I'm doing now and today in particular, taking those techniques that work for journalists, that work for PR professionals, applying them to our own lives. And in today's case, resumes, cover letters, and email outreach, the same strategies that a journalist employ to capture your attention are the same strategies you must use to grab the attention of a busy HR director or an employer who is going through mounds and mounds of applications. What's going to make yours stand out? So if you're so interested, that's my name on Twitter and Instagram, Danny H. Rubin. Feel free to give a follow. Love to have you in our, our network. And our, my company is called Rubin, just the last name Rubin developing and, and building ourselves into a brand that helps K through 12 and higher ed and the corporate side as well, learn to write and speak on a higher level than the competition to go after real life opportunities. So that's what, what we do, what I do and, and my quick background. I also wanna point out, and I mentioned it to the folks from the first webinar too, that I've written three books since Maryland over the last several years, written three different books and each one is a collection of templates and guides. It's like scripts and how-tos for different sets of business 
scenario. So the blue book, how, wait, how do I write this email? Writing and speaking skills and templates for networking and the job search, resumes, cover letters, follow-up notes, thank you notes, handwritten notes, phone scripts, LinkedIn, a ton of stuff to help you have a starting point for many difficult conversations in career development. The green book, wait, how do I promote my business, writing and speaking skills for entrepreneurship. If you are at home right now thinking, now is the time in my life to start my own business, to, to develop my side hustle, to grow something from scratch, this book is full of templates and guides for website pages and fundraising pitches and Kickstarter pages and press releases and all the writing around launching something. And lastly, wait, how do I lead my team? Writing and speaking skills for leadership and management. Learning how to communicate effectively with the right tone, clarity, logical structure to send messages down to your team, communicate up to a board, to your bosses, to, to investors, learning how to be a clear communicator across all circumstances. So these books cover a wide array of topics, over 300 writing and speaking templates in all. And yes, they are on Amazon if you're so inclined. And you know, whatever road you're going down, hopefully one of these books could be a resource to you. I want you to know that they're here. Um, and as a company, we, we have three main sort of prongs. We have our online curriculum for classroom instruction and career service offices. It's called Emerge, and it's a set of online curriculum, distance learning curriculum, which is even more relevant today, helping students write and speak to open doors for themselves. We have online courses through our website for working professionals, like short courses on email writing, resumes, cover letters, LinkedIn. And we have an a online community for young professionals. Young is a relative term. It could be 20s through 40-ish, 50-ish. We're always young at heart. So for those of you who want to be part of a free community where we share resources, have Q&As, have special guests, we go to Facebook and type Aspire with Ruben. You'll find it, request to join, and we'll let you in. So that's what we do as a brand and as a business right now. So what are we going to do Today, we're gonna to cover three main topics, as I mentioned, unforgettable resumes, and we're gonna learn how to use precise detail to stand out so that no one could ever say, I've read 10 of the same resume over and over in the last hour. You never want someone to say that about yours. With all of your experience, all of your ability, you would never want someone to say, I've read that resume before. That should make you go crazy, that someone would think that about you. Then we're gonna talk about my, my favorite topic really in all of this, <clears throat> coming right out of my time as a journalist, learning to tell a story of our own past success in a cover letter. <clears throat> Excuse me, I gotta drink my water. <clears throat> learning to tell an example <clears throat> of what we have achieved and to break through with an example of our grit. And lastly, we're gonna cover outreach emails. And we're going to talk about the number one strategy that 99% of job seekers never do. That's a good little headline, right? In terms of, you know, online news, you'd click on that. What's the one thing that almost nobody thinks about doing when they send an email saying, can I work for you? Can I intern for you? Do you have a job opportunity? Almost no one thinks to do this one thing. I'm going to leave you in suspense until we get there. Okay. So let's hop in. And I'm drawing today from the blue book that I showed you called, How Do I Write This Email? Wait, How Do I Write This Email? With examples. Let's talk about bullet points under a job on our resume. This is a section from the book and I just pasted it here so we could see it and read it together. Let's say that Shannon Jones lands a job through a temp agency to file papers and answer phones out of medical practice. Maybe not the job she wants for 30 years because it's a temp job and she expires for more, but it's what she has right now. So on her resume, these are the three bullets. Answer phones and provide customer service at a medical office. Assist people with concerns in a friendly and courteous manner. File patient paperwork and help to keep the office organized. But my question to you is, where is the drama? Let me move my little thing out of the way so I can read my own writing on the screen. Where's the drama? How can she add sizzle to a quote unquote ordinary job? Oh, not, uh, what I do isn't all that special. This is just you know, what they ask of me. Let me ask you in the chat, can anybody tell me what's missing from these bullets? What would you like to see? What doesn't jump out to you? What's not there? And I'll reveal it on the next slide, but I wanna see if anybody has any thoughts 
initially. Jessica Ford, right on the money. Numbers, right? What we're missing are numbers, data, quantifying. Let's go to that next slide. And we're going to look at the same three bullets, but now you see what's different. Answer more than 75 phone calls a day at one of the busiest medical practices in Houston. Check in 50 to 60 patients each day. Often work with three to four people at a time. Help to manage files for nearly 2,700 patients and digitize critical medical information. So, I think we all know what's here now. I, we already sort of saw it in the chat, we discussed it. There are numbers. Are there other specifics too? Do you see an, a proper noun, an, an interesting other noun that jumps out to you, maybe in that first bullet point? What jumps out to you in that first bullet? Busiest medical practices in Houston. Okay, let's go back to those first set of bullets. Answer phones provide customer service at a medical office. Now, answer more than 75 phone calls a day at one of the busiest medical practices in Houston, okay? Let me help you understand even clearer terms. How many people, whoop, let me go back. How many people could write these first three bullets about all kinds of jobs? Someone can say in the chat, like anyone doing any kind of customer service, right? Could write these bullets for their job, which puts you in the same category on paper with anybody else. Now, how many people could write these three bullet points in this order, in this exact way? There's only one person on earth, or at least one person in that job applicant pool who could write it this exact way. Because these are the numbers that she owns, okay? This is one of the biggest things I want you to take away from today's webinar. You have numbers, you have successes, and you have stories that belong to you. And if you're not willing or able to share them on paper in a job application, then you are giving up your best stuff and the employer will never know because you do not have the opportunity to sit over their shoulder as they read about you and say, oh, actually, what I meant to say was I answer more than 75 phone calls a day. You're not there. They're making snap judgments about what they are reading. So your best stuff has to be on the page. Can somebody share a number from their own career? A number that shows the scope of the work, the number of people you manage or the size of a budget you oversee or the size of an event that you put on. Can you go to the chat and share one of your numbers? I want us to understand how we obtain and uncover our own numbers. It's really important that we know what numbers we own and how to find them. Can somebody share a number that they have from their work in a current or past role? And go to the chat and, and tell us all. And yeah. While we hopefully someone will chime in. And I, I want us to think about it this way. There you go. Tammy Mariani, $46 million reorganization. Whoa. That's big time. See, imagine if she had just said on her on paper, I was part of a major reorganization, right? Imagine if you said major reorganization, Tammy. Now, the, the employer would never know that was $46 million. They might think it was just shuffling people around. They would have no clue the amount of money you were dealing with. And, and Holly, to Holly's point, she said overachieved sales goal year over year by 54%. One thing we're going to talk about in the next slide, Holly, is make sure the 54% has context. Put numbers around it. You started at X number, 54% greater was at X number. The percentage alone won't do it. You have to put the numbers too. So we know the size and scope of what you did. Okay, one needed the same way. If you're gonna show improvement with percentages, you have to put the numbers with it. Or we don't, we don't know what the numbers are. You know, you increased our sales 50%, went from one sale to, to two sales, you know, or 100%, right? It, we, have to, we have to know the number. So make sure that you are attaching the actual numbers of what you did. And think hard about the numbers you own. Ask yourself, how much, how often, how many? Dig deep in your life. Re you know, sort of interrogate yourself like a reporter from the Washington Post and find the numbers that you own and bring them to the surface and make sure they are in your resume. And make sure as well, you're using proper nouns. If there's a name of a client you worked with or a particular initiative, 
put those words in there. I promise you the employer is going to notice your numbers and your proper nouns before anything else. Their eyes will glaze over all the stuff about being hardworking and diligent and dedicated and blah, blah, blah. And they're going to go right for your numbers and right for the proper nouns. And if your resume has more numbers and proper nouns than somebody else, you wrote a better resume. Because at the end of the day, it's giving somebody something that's relevant and meaningful and frankly enjoyable to read. So it's on you, it's on all of us to say, what are my numbers? What are my specifics? Are they in my resume? All right. Danny, can Let's I ask on. a quick question? This is Ellie yeah. here. For those folks that are on the call right now that might not have a lot of numbers that come into play on the day to day, could you just give an example of what numbers you could pull from? Yes, it's yes, right, a great you. question because, because here's the thing, and I've done this with students too. People say, I don't have any numbers. What are my numbers? Let me give you an example, okay? I asked a student, she was a senior in college just a few weeks ago on a, on a webinar, and she's in South Dakota. And I said, do you have a part-time job? She said, yeah, but I don't know what my numbers would be. I said, what was your part-time job? She said, I'm a hostess, I'm a waitress at a restaurant, or I guess she was before all of this, right? And I said, okay, well, let's think about your numbers. How many people do you wait on in a week? She's like, well, I'm, I'm part-time, maybe like 50. I said, and, and how many people do you think you wait on in a month? Well, maybe like 400. Okay, so you're waiting on 400 people every month at a busy restaurant. We can find a number in any circumstance. Okay, another young one said she was working uh, a summer job doing maintenance for a school system. I said, okay, how many schools did you clean? Oh, there's like 27 buildings, okay. And we also cleaned outside too, we cleaned, we cleaned sports fields. Okay, how many sports fields did you clean? Oh, like 62. Okay, so you cleaned 62 sports fields in 27 schools over a seven week period. Yeah, I guess I did. I said, those are your numbers because those are impressive. It's not enough to just say I did maintenance or I wait tables. You, everyone has numbers because we're all helping someone else. We're doing a service. So think deeply about what the work is. Think about it over a week, over a month, over a year. Things add up. Numbers become huge. One other quick example. Another young man said, I sold cars over the summer. And he told me he sold, like, I forget the exact amount, but at the end of the summer, he had sold the equivalent of like $8 million worth of cars. And when I said that back to him, the whole class was like, oh, you could feel it. Like he had no idea he sold $8 million worth of cars. So it, the numbers are there. We all have them. And if you have to fight hard to find them because you cannot put a resume out there in the world that looks generic. Not now. Not with 22 million people unemployed or whatever the number is. This is not the time to look generic of, of any time in our lives. You have to share what you own. Okay, and we're gonna keep working through that. I'm gonna show you some more examples in a minute. All right, there you go. Prepped cooking lessons, ingredients for 650 people a day. That's great, Allison. And then think about it over a week, over a month. How big does that number get? I talked to a teacher last week. They're making lunches for their school system. Every day they're preparing 7,000 lunches a day. Think about what that is over six weeks. I mean, these are massive numbers. And you own those numbers. You've got to share them. They're all around us. Okay. So let's talk about another point. There's some more numbers in here, but I want to talk about another huge part of a resume, which is to give context. I'm really big on context. Journalists always give context. They explain a situation so you understand how it fits into the bigger picture. Okay. So this is what I want you to do from, from now on with your resume. It's in this first bullet. Okay. In that first bullet, you need to give a half a line explanation on what your company does or did in a previous company. You cannot assume that the reader has any idea what you did at a previous company. You cannot assume they know what that company does, what they sell, what they offer. You must assume out in the world and applying for jobs that no one knows a dang thing about you. And you got to start from the beginning. So here, we have nonprofit A, just a generic word. And we say part of an organization that raises more than $8 million annually for cancer research. So what do we do in that line? We explain what the company does. So then every other bullet that comes below it has context. 
We can't start rattling off our achievements, how much money we've raised, how many people we manage, if the person doesn't even know what the company does. They can't put those numbers in any context. You're like, I was number one salesperson last year, increased my sales 500%. And they're like, I don't even know what you were selling, right? Remember, all they know is what's on this page. So we need to use that first bullet to give context. So think about the companies that you will list on your resume. How can you describe what they do in a very short sentence? We need to learn the power of brevity. And this first bullet is gonna say, this is the work that I did. This is the work that our team did or does. And then you can get into your numbers, your achievements, your specifics. And again, I was mentioning to some people, we don't wanna just share percentage increases without the numbers because we don't know the percentages are useless without numbers attached. So here we said, we grew the organization's fa uh, Facebook fan base from 247 to 5438 over a two year period. Over four months, led a team of six people to digitize 2000 financial documents, right? So we're hard on those numbers. We are on the ground floor with numbers. But we begin with context. Here's one other example, okay? Again, made up, all fictitious. Let's read these out together. Coordinated fundraising efforts to build playgrounds in low income areas. So again, context. What the heck does this organization do? Too often the name of the organization or company does not tell you what they do. It could be a random word. We have no clue what they do. Managed event coordination for the inaugural Come Play Milwaukee. That is a specific name of an event. A 500 plus person cocktail party and fundraiser that exceeded expectations and brought in $350,000. Hard number. Oversaw caterer, decorations, sponsorships, live music, and silent auction. Wrote organization's weekly blog post, group email list from 110 to 1200, and created a tracking spreadsheet to better organize fundraising efforts. So just specifics, up and down. We know exactly what they did in the job, what the company does. We have some of their biggest achievements. We have hard numbers. What else do I need to tell you? I get stuff done, right? I am a doer. I am a successful, effective person. Here's the proof. Are there any questions about this idea? I think the next thing is that, yeah. Before we dive into the cover letter, I want to pause for one second, see if there's any questions about numbers, specifics, giving context. If you can commit to those ideas, you will write a great resume, okay? You don't need to be a wordsmith. You don't need to pay thousands of dollars to a career coach for them to work on it for you, okay? You know what you need to do. You know what you've done. You know what you've achieved. Get a Word document out and just make a big list of all your numbers, all your achievements, context around your business or your company, your team, and then piece it together using these slides. You know what you've done. And we do not want to overthink it. The answers are right there, just beneath the surface. Just ask yourselves the right questions. Okay. Oh, and hold on. There's a message. Sorry. Oh, this wasn't updating. Uh, oh, there we go. Do you have suggestions for those of us with volunteer and internships? Yes. It works the same way. The numbers as a volunteer or intern are the same as if you were in that job you know, at a paid capacity. We have numbers. If you're an intern, okay, and they have you going to different meetings how many meetings did you attend if they had you updating a database how, all the grunt work that nobody wants to do except the intern right how many data points were in that database how much how many things did you update they have you updating a contact list or a directory how many people did you have to research whatever you're doing there's going to be numbers and quite frankly the more grueling the task the more compelling it looks on paper i i've even said this to students in high school if all you've ever done, it, and I should have had the slide, but we were talking to, you know, working professionals today, but if all you've ever done is mowed somebody's lawn or babysat, you could talk about that just the same. You know, in a six week period, I mowed 112 yards. I mean, there's numbers everywhere. How do you prioritize a few bullets of information in which you have multiple roles and projects? Good question, Miriam. So the first bullet point's gotta be the context because nothing makes sense or nothing matters if you don't tell them how it all fits, right? That's the first, and it's quick. Then, my, my, I encourage you, keep that resume to one page. 
I can't get into the discussion with people. I've done so much. I've had so many jobs. All I'm going to tell you right now, you got to keep it on one page. People don't have the time for two, three, and four pages. We're talking about one page resumes. That's my stance. And that's how we're going to proceed in this conversation. So for that first most recent job, you can maybe have four bullets. As you go down in your timeline, maybe three bullets, maybe two, maybe one, the job down at the bottom has one bullet. You have to decide what is the best thing I could tell somebody. Yes, Fuller, I would say do your best to keep it to one page. I recognize if we have you know, a lengthy career, there's so much we want to say and share, but I promise you, less is more. Less is always more. Work hard to condense what you you've done give somebody an elevator pitch don't don't make them spend a lot of time sifting through everything you've ever touched okay this is the time to say what is the absolute best thing i can put on paper so they're going to put me in the yes pile and give me to that phone interview or give me to that zoom chat so that i can talk about myself in full we have to be critical about ourselves right now this this is not the time to just put it all on the page it's too much information and it's overwhelming and you're not being decisive enough to tell somebody the things that are most important on that page. You're putting too much other stuff around it. You're burying your best stuff. Published articles, workshops presented. I understand on the academic side, you may want to make that like a separate document so that your resume is one page. Your academic journal publishing and things that on that nature, make it a separate document so it doesn't feel like you're forcing them to go through a three page resume. Say, here's my one page resume. And here's a list of the things or places where I've been published. Keep them separate so they don't feel the heavy burden of a three-page resume. Okay. Another good question from Stefan. How do you sort of where do you where's the cutoff in, in past roles? It, as a starting point, Stefan, it starts with: Am I running out of room? Right? Am I running out of room to talk about myself? I still need to include my education. I need to include you know any kind of sort of civic entities or any sort of community involvement or other things I want to say about myself. So you need to decide, am I running out of space? You may have to lop off your first two jobs if you had four cents, right? Or maybe you just provide one quick bullet on that job just so they know that you did that job because maybe it's relevant for the job you're applying for now, right? What I'm saying to everybody is you must be hyper critical, hyper, hyper critical about what you include. Because leaving things out oftentimes is going to be a better course of action than, than throwing it all in. All right. And a CV is not a resume. Uh, it gets a little muddy for me. CV has always felt a little more academic. I just think that knowing people's habits and tendencies, if you give them a clean, tight, one-page resume, they're going to appreciate that. If it's full of good information, they'll appreciate it even more. All we really want is for them to say, highly, you know, high qualified candidate, let's talk to them, right? Because we want to have the conversation. They're not going to hire us just off the resume alone. That's the first foot in the door, coupled with what we're going to talk about now, which I hope will be a game changer for you, which is the storytelling cover letter. And yes, and Monica, thanks for bringing this up. I meant to say, be keyword driven as much as possible. It gets back to my original point. Lean hard on key terms, specifics, proper nouns. If there are certain certifications or software or technical skills that you know the company is seeking, make sure they live on your resume. We, we talk, I didn't get into it today, but we, you should have a skills section of your resume where you infuse that section with key terms. Don't, and don't fill that up with dedicated, leader, dependable, time management. Nobody is searching for those things. No company is sifting through with an algorithm looking for someone that says they're dependable, but they are looking for somebody who can do Adobe Photoshop, right? So make sure the, the technical skill you possess, the proper nouns are in your resume along with your numbers. So it, it, it meets the needs of both the computer generated algorithm and the human eye. All right, enough on that. Let's hop over to our cover letter. And this is a, my own personal mantra. When you learn to tell your own story, doors will open. And I hope you'll understand that in just a minute when I show you an example of how to tell your own story, especially right now 
while we're all going through some of the toughest moments of our lives, now is the time to tell a damn good story. And you've all got one. So let's hop to it. The story that you're gonna tell should come from the last three to six months. It needs to be a little bit fresh. I don't wanna hear about something you did in college or something you did 10 years ago. You know, as the expression goes, what have you done for me lately? It can come from if you're a student, from a class, from an internship, on the job, or even from your personal life if you don't have a relevant example from any of those first three. But ideally, it'll come from class, an internship, or a job. Let me show you what I mean. This is, again, coming out of our book. And this is a sort of a six-part cover letter. I want to walk us through each one. You can go back and reference this slide deck later. This is the intro to a new age cover letter. So switch your thinking on cover letters and follow me here. Dear Mr. or Ms. or dear hiring professional, Jim Robisky said no to me so many times I lost count. As a sales rep for a mid-sized IT firm, I tried time and again to convince Robisky, the VP of technology for a large hospital system, he needed to upgrade all of his servers and begin to move much of the hospital's data onto the cloud. Phone calls, handwritten notes, drop-in visits, nothing seemed to work. That is the intro paragraph. So forget every other cover letter you've ever written. We are launching into a, a problem, a challenge. We are kicking it off with a story. I'll fill this all in as we go. All right. Then I took a different approach. I knew Rabinsky typically attends a monthly networking event at the Chamber of Commerce. I also expected another client of ours who has fully embraced the cloud to be at the event too. When I saw both people in the room, a coworker and I introduced the two, mentioned the benefits of cloud computing, and let my client sing its praises to Robisky. A few moments later, Robisky turned to me and said, call my office on Monday. I think I'm ready to explore the cloud a bit more. Okay, I have some questions for the group. All right, let me get down to the bottom of the chat. Now, what are some of the qualities and characteristics that this person demonstrates in the story? Put them in the chat. What kind of person do we see here? Persistence. What else? What are some of their qualities? Thinking outside the box, says Laura. Networking. Problem solving. We can probably put attributes in the chat all day long. Creative, flexibility. Now let me ask all of you, were any of those words you just typed in this cover letter? Did you hear me say them? Because this is the, this is the key, listen closely. Anyone can say that they are, as I go back through the chat, flexible, creative, a problem solver, persistent. Anyone can say that, but where's the proof? Those words are empty. They hold no meaning. Go find them in your cover letter and delete them and replace them with an actual moment from your life where you were faced with a challenge and had to figure it out. Because we all have those moments and we can work through that mental process right now of figuring out what that story is going to be for you. But we all have challenges. We're all juggling, especially now. And your Oh, the onus is on you to lead off that cover letter with a story of how you fought through a tough task. It could be, you know, within a project, on the job, whatever it is, we all have it. So no longer will you lead off with my name is so-and-so, I'm interested in the position of blank, I'm a problem solver, I'm dedicated, I'm a leader, forget all of that. What matters most is your story. And I promise you, and we have so many examples from times we've taught this with students and working professionals, they send off a cover letter like this, that phone starts ringing. And the employer's like, I really loved your cover letter. I read 100 applications today, you're the only one I remember. Because everyone else is saying, I'm great, pick me. And you are actually giving a clear example of why you are great. And the difference is so stark and so striking that you become unforgettable. And that's what we need to be in the COVID era as much as ever before is the most unforgettable person 
in that stack of applicants. And the way you get there is by telling your story better than somebody else. Now you'll notice that was part two. There are six parts to this cover letter and I'm going to show you the remainder. And again, you can go back and look at a different time at, at all of this, but I want to take it all the way through. Okay. Part three. Oh, the other thing that we never even said yet, there's something else missing from this cover letter so far. Does anybody know what we don't even know yet? There's some other piece of detail that we haven't even divulged. I'll give you a second to take a crack at it. Then I'll just tell you, what do we not even know? If I'm the employer, there's something I don't know. The job one. Yes. What else do we not know? We don't even know the person's name in the cover letter. We didn't say their name yet, right? We don't know their name and we don't know what job. And let me just add this before I go to the next slide. When all that matters in the world is how hard you work. And people will make snap judgments on your name, your culture, your background, your gender, your age. People will it make it make have biases pre-programmed in their head based on the demographics of what you they think you are but all that matters is how hard you work and when you can demonstrate how hard you work first anything else they might have thought about you falls away telling great stories and writing great job applications like this is an equalizer and it democratizes opportunity so lead with your work ethic everything else comes second so let's get into that third part whoops sorry Six months later, the hospital system remains our biggest client. My name is Stephen Hirsch, and I want to be your next sales executive. I know sales is a tough game, but I enjoy the chance to win over even the most stubborn prospect. Okay, so we say their name and their job after we prove who we are, because we are in a race against time. If all I have time for is to tell you how great I am, as an example, that's what I'm going to do. My name and what I want is secondary to that. That's how you tell a great story. Now let's go to the next part. Another strategy that so few job seekers think to do, but I'm gonna show you right now. As I read about your company, I learned a lot about the software you've developed, in this case, like a child educational software company, playtime card game, and how it can make a real impact on school age children. Through my research, I also understand the educational software landscape is highly competitive. It takes a combination of great products and a committed sales team to find continued success. Let me ask the group. Did you see a proper noun in there somewhere? Which, what did I mention? It's in that second line. Tell me the name of the product, Fuller. Playtime card game, right? Now, what does that prove? See, once again, too many job applications and covered letters in this second part, or somewhere in the cover letter, it says, your company is amazing. And I just love the work you do. And I would love to be part of your team. And that's as far as they take it. And that falls so hard on the ground. The employer's like, yeah, whatever. You, you put that same sentence in every cover letter you sent around. Why would I ever believe you? If I pressed you and said, name one of our products, you couldn't do it but now you can. Let me ask the group, where would you go? And I talked about this in the LinkedIn exercise, so some of you can, if you know the answer, hold off. Where would you go on the company website to learn about Playtime Card Game, for instance? Where would you go? What pages would you research to see all the cool things that they're doing? Products, maybe? Where else might you go to see the latest and greatest from the company? From Acme Toy, blogs, newsletters, press releases. That's right, news. I want you to commit from this day forward, anytime you apply for a job, before you send off that application, you need to visit their website. You need to go to a page like news or press releases, and you need to read about what they do. And you need to take an example from their website, like Playtime Card Game, you need to bring it back into your cover letter. You need to speak with specifics about what they do. No more lip service. This is not the time to be cookie cutter. You have to be laser focused on these applications now. Zero margin for error. So part four will make a huge difference. You're gonna tell a great story 
and you're going to show precise research. Not only does it make you a compelling job candidate, it would make you a great employee. To be that thorough and that self-aware, who wouldn't want to hire that kind of person? But that person is so rare. But that could be you if you change your thinking about how to send applications. I'm not here to point a finger at anybody. We just need to change how we approach this age-old strategy of applying for a job. Lastly, above all, I want to apply my sales experience in a meaningful way and would enjoy helping children develop math and reading skills from an early age. I also like to collaborate with other team members, craft smart sales and marketing strategies, and work alongside people who are passionate about early education. I didn't show you, but these are some of the bullets that were in the job description. They're saying we're looking for somebody who likes to be part of a team and someone who is passionate about early education, right? So we include some of those, th those ideas towards the end of our cover letter, okay? Allison says a specific site to research the company. Yeah, you want to go to the company's website. That's all you need. That is all you need. Most companies will put something out there about their recent achievements. If you can't find anything there, Google their name, try to find a news article or a, a social media post. But 99 times out of 100, the company website is all you need. Everything you need is sitting there in plain sight to turn around and use to impress them. It's an amazing thing. Now, the last part, this is a journalistic strategy. It's called book ending. All right, look what we do. The Jim Rubisky experience proved without, with enough grit and creativity, I can make the deal happen. I would love the chance to bring my skill set and work ethic to your team. So what did we do? What does book ending mean? It means we start our cover letter with a story and we end with a reference to that same story. It brings the cover letter 360 degrees and it gives it a nice tight closure. And you'll see so many articles in the newspaper and magazines where they start with a profile on a person, then they tell you the bigger picture and then they end again with that person. It just feels right to the reader. It feels like they, they really did get to the end and there's a true finish line. So this is the model I encourage you to use from this day forward. Tell a great story do honest research. It is the best way to impress somebody who doesn't know you yet, has no reason to know you were like you, but they're going to really like you and respect you at the end of this cover letter. And I know it's big and blown up on these slides, but if you put it on a page, what I just showed you, it's three quarters of a page. That's it. And it's in short paragraphs. It's easy to read and absorb. So it's not our entire life story. It's a clear moment in time where we're like, I got it done, okay? Are there questions about the storytelling idea before we go to our final topic, which is email outreach? I know this is like a new idea for some of you, maybe all of you. I hope that it hits you the right way because no longer should we be vague and nondescript about our experiences. Our stories are all we have. Any questions here? Fuller says, uh, is an older story ever okay? Well, older is, we have to be careful with that term. I mean, we don't wanna share something that happened, you know, three, four, five years ago. Things have happened in your life since then that you can recall. So we really needed to say at maximum within the past year. But the sooner you, the sooner it happened, the better. There's, there's a sense of energy and momentum around immediacy. We don't want to be yesterday's news, as the expression goes. And yes, Jessica, no longer than a page. You should be able to tell your story and reference their work in less than a page. Nobody wants to deal with a two-page cover letter. Absolutely not. And if you did it that way, you went on too long. So really go to somebody you trust and respect and say, does there a part of this where it kind of drags? Is there a part that I don't need to include? We want to tell the problem of the situation, the process of how we work through it, and the solution. And let me make just a quick note here. I want to go back. This section is so critical. We don't want to say, oh, there's a big problem and I fixed it. What really matters here where we're being judged is on the process. What steps did I take to fix the problem? That's where you're going to make your mark. 
So we told a very specific moment about this networking event, how he connected a current client with this potential client. That's process. Get us in the nitty gritty of what you did. Steps one, steps two, step three. That matters so much. Otherwise, it's like, well, how do they fix it? They didn't tell me. You're judged on how you deal with difficult moments, how you work through them. <clears throat> Stay composed. That's what they want to hire. All right. And I mentioned this before. Stereotypes, bias, and prejudice go out the window. Let them judge you on how hard you work. Don't ever let them judge you on things on the surface, ever. You're worth way more than that. Okay. Now, let's talk lastly about the job outreach email. Okay. You'll see some familiar themes. I wanted to show you first the subject line. Let's say in this case that you're <clears throat> coming around looking for an opportunity. They may not have a job posted. You'd like to work there. You want to see what's possible. It's kind of a cold email, right? That's tough. It's a busy person. Why do they want to talk to you? Here's an example of a subject line. Either something like recent graduate from University of Maryland or your job title. Interested in career opportunities. Again, we're going to hit them with specifics. We're going to name drop our school or we're going to name drop our job title. It's more interesting than like making introductions or saying hello or reaching out. We need to be clear and decisive with our words at every turn. Subject lines above all, because if it's not a strong subject line, the email is being ignored. Now, let's go into that email. You'll see another familiar theme. I'm a broken record here, but this is the strategy. All right. I realize you don't have a job posting for, let's say, a development associate, but I would still like to make introductions and explore ways I can help your team on blank. In this case, upcoming engagements with nonprofit. This is where most emails stop, right here. And they're like, here's my resume, let me know. And it falls flat because nobody wants to deal with somebody who's just coming around with their hand out. All right, now is where the magic happens. And we already talked about it once. So this is going to look familiar to you. I checked out the name of company website and respect the work you do. In particular, the 10K walk to support research on brain cancer and the capital campaign to aid the river cleanup. The two projects were well orchestrated and it's clear your team knows how to deliver results. Let me ask the group. Those words are underlined. What do you think that means? What does an underline mean in, a, in an email on a website? And let me help you out. Let's imagine that they're blue. Thank you. It's a link. <laughs> so what does that mean? If it's blue and it's linked, what does that mean I did? What did I do? I did my homework. I shared two examples and I linked them directly to the website where they talk about those two projects. It's so simple, right? But as I said at the beginning, 99% of job seekers never do this. They don't think to do this. When you want something to happen in the world, you gotta give before you can get. You gotta make them love you by showing that you love them. That's how the world turns, even in a pandemic, especially in a pandemic. So you cannot send any more emails asking for opportunities without including your research. And the research cannot be left at, I think your company is amazing and I'd love to be part of your team. If you write that, you may as well have written nothing. You have to add the links that take you right to their work. And I promise you, it's easy to find. Yes, Kalika, you should use this same idea in a LinkedIn post. And we talked about that last time. Go into their LinkedIn profile, pull out something from their profile that intrigues you about their career and say it back to them. Yes, this is called an ego boost. It's not brown nosing. It's making them feel that you respect who they are. And if you do want to work at that company, you should know what they do. 
it's not enough to just learn about what they do once you're hired. You need to send these emails and walk in the interview room, or sit on that Zoom chat, ready to talk about them in equal measure as you're about to talk about yourself. Because they're gonna ask you, have you looked at our website? Have you seen what we do? And you need to step into that answer. It can't be a half-baked answer like, oh yeah, I sort of kind of, I glanced this morning. No, be ready for that moment. Other applicants will stammer through that answer. You're going to have a clear answer and they're going to respect you for that. And it starts in that outreach message where they didn't even know you, but because you took the time to know them, your chance at a response is much greater because you're showing poise and smarts and authenticity, which are rare commodities today. All right, any questions on that idea? Okay, as a recap, just to mention it, I did this on the last chat too. If there are any educators on here who would like, we're offering an email etiquette lesson plan from our online platform. If you're interested in sharing that with students and learning, it's like it's a curriculum based tool with some PDF worksheets. Type interested, and Ellie and her team will send it to you afterwards. For anybody who wants to take these lessons further, keep it going. We have some short courses on our website at the following web address, store.rubeneducation.com. And if you are interested in being part of our online Facebook community for young professionals, type Aspire with Ruben on Facebook. And we'll let you in that group, okay? These are the short courses that we offer right now. All the information is on that page. You can look at your leisure. I wanted you to know it's there. All right. So, with that said, with eight minutes to spare, what questions can I answer? Should we pay for LinkedIn? That, you know, that's a good question. It, there are certain there's certain value to paying. You can see more profiles. You can look into people more deeply. It's possible. I would try your best to network without it. If there's somebody that you just can't seem to get to without paying for it, you may want to try it out for a couple months and see if it helps. I'm, I'm sure there are there is a value to that. I'm not saying there isn't. But before you start sinking money, see what you can do with your own rolled up sleeves. All right. Let me come back here to the screen. What other questions can I answer for folks? Oh, I can just jump LA in. <laughs> I can jump in and answer that one, Allison. Yes, I will send out the recording from the last webinar if you missed it. And um, all of Danny's webinars that he'll be doing in this three part series are being recorded and sent to anyone who registered. Yeah. How would these recommendations change for grad school applications versus job hunting? Miriam, they, they, sh they shouldn't change much at all. We're still going to share a great story. We're still going to share our detail of what we've done, doing research or out in the field, whatever you've done, tell stories, use specifics, lean on your numbers, do research on people. It's all the same strategies. All that changes is our story and what we're putting on the page, but the approach remains. And we should use this approach all of our lives when we're looking for opportunities. If you're not going to tell a great story, then they're not going to remember you. They're just, it's, or it's going to be much, much harder because they're just going to, you're going to be another resume they had to go through. And again, as I said at the beginning, you never want someone to say that about you. And I hope that would make you agitated because somebody would say, ah, just another, another application. You know, you'll never know they said it, but they probably said it to somebody else on their team and that would, that should burn you up. How do companies companies do not want cover letters? Okay, here's how good question. Let's say you my 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 recommendation is if it's not required, you should still submit one that tells a great story. It can't hurt you. If it's written well enough and helps showcase what your character and work ethic, submit one. If you simply can't, if it's an online app and you can't do it, then you have your stories queued up for that interview. And here's a tactic that we talk about in the book. It's called my three stories. Okay. You're going to come in that interview room 
with three stories written down, like the names of the stories on a piece of paper. And please come in that room with, with a way to take notes. It's so obnoxious when an employer is rattling off information, advice, whatever, and the, the job seeker is like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And they're not writing anything down. It's like, I'm wasting my breath, right? So you're gonna come in and you're gonna have three stories jotted down. Two stories about times that you solve problems at work and one about something interesting from your personal life. And in the flow of that interview, any question they answer you, or they, any question they ask you, you can answer with a story. Why are you interested in this position? Why are you a good fit for this position? Anything they ask, you can say, you know what? Can I tell you a quick story about why I'm a good fit? And then you look at your notes and say, oh yeah, yeah, I wanted to tell that story about the, the in the book we call it the fire alarm, a fire alarm incident. And it jogs your memory, and then you tell that story right to their face. But you write it down for yourself so that in the moment you don't get frozen and forget what you wanted to say. You give it as a bit of a guide to remind you what you wanted to share. So if you can't put it in the cover letter, you say it on the phone or you say it in the, in the interview. You lead with your stories at every turn because that's the best way to prove who you are and make the experience memorable for that person sitting across from you. And Fuller says, many people don't check the website or what we do before they show up. 99% of the time. It's just not a way we are conditioned in a very me first culture. And the people who can think about others first have the doors open the fastest. Always think about other people first, how it'll make them feel if you know about them. Incredible things can happen when we switch our thinking. Yes, you can have it on your iPhone, but I think it's more impressive if you come in with a, a pad and paper and a pen. It's not old school. It's just like, if you're looking at your phone, they could think you were checking an email. You shouldn't even touch your phone in that moment. Your phone should stay in the car. At, at worst, it should be in your bag. You have, you're coming in there with a folder and notes and you're writing stuff down and you have questions ready and you have stories ready and you're telling yourself, you're like, oh, that's a great point. There's not, that's not weakness, that's strength. Because employers want people who will be teachable, who can be coached. They don't want know-it-alls. Who wants to hire a know-it-all? They want you to have some skills and some hustle, but they want to make you one of theirs. They want to mold you into what they are. So you got to come with that idea. Did you create recruiter interviews the same as interviews with the employer? Absolutely. You should look up what the recruiter's done. Look up their LinkedIn profile. Talk about their career. Wow, you have such a long, long history in recruiting. I saw you started an entry level at the firm. Now you're executive vice president. How'd you do that? Oh, well, thank you for asking. You know, it's been an interesting journey for me. And all the while, they're like, I like this person. I'm going to recommend them for a job. Right? And you're not talking. You're listening. You could probably make the recruiter talk about themselves more than they talk about you, more than you talk about yourself. And at the end of that conversation, they really like you. Think about that. Think about the dynamics at play. You're making them wanna hire you by letting them talk about themselves. Humans are very simple. We're simple beings. We don't take much, just a little bit of water, right? If you're older, it can show how you, you can use technology. I don't, I mean, taking out your cell phone and showing you can look at notes on an iPhone, I don't think that demonstrates you know, technological expertise. I, would, I don't want to see somebody's phone in an interview. I want their full attention. I'm the boss, right? So come in with notes. Come in with a way to take notes in an old school fashion. Leave your phone somewhere else. It, it's just, there's too many ways you could throw somebody off. It's like, you're going to look, look, look at your phone. They're like, oh, I'm sorry, do you, are you busy or something? Do you have a call you need to take? You're like, you're here to interview. You're like, no, 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 no. I was reading notes on my phone. It's like, it's just, it's such a danger zone. Like, don't even, don't even touch it. Don't even go near that. Don't even let that moment happen. You're coming in with paper and pen, stuff already written down, and a pen to keep taking more notes. That's what professionals do. Because that's what you would do in a client meeting. You might have a laptop out, but like you're, you're there to take notes. You're there to absorb. You're there to ask questions, right? That's where we got to be. I know it's one o'clock, so I'll let Ellie jump in. I don't want to hold us. There's lots of good questions coming in, so you can tell me from here. 
Great, thank you so much, Danny. Um, and those of you who haven't gotten your questions answered, feel free to reach out to Danny um, and get those questions answered. I'm sure he, he is willing to share his expertise with you all. Um, thanks again for tuning in everyone. And just a reminder that we do have one more webinar in this three-part series that's happening on May 5th at 12 p.m. So feel free to join us again. We will be here and Danny will be answering all your questions. Um, again, this will be recorded and sent out to everyone, but um, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Everyone's staying healthy and thanks again to Danny. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Stay thanks. safe. Have a good day.